So today I want to pick up my reading in Amos chapter <clears throat> 7. And it says, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Thus hath the Lord showed unto me, and behold the Lord God called to contend by fire. And it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. The Lord, This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear to bear his wor all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman, and herdman, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his own land. Oh, it's kind of a uh, intense chapter. <clears throat> Not as intense as some of the ones we read in Ezekiel, but still, <clears throat> that last curse is kind of, I don't know, it's pretty, pretty intense. Um, so basically what's happening in this chapter is he starts off when it talks about a ladder growth it's talking about the harvest um and so there's like a wheat harvest and they harvest the first um crop of wheat and then the second crop of wheat grows up and the grasshoppers destroy that and it has to do with the destruction of israel and, and amos understands this and he's asking god um or he's praying to god he says please forgive because Jacob is small, how, how shall he arise? And God, of course, repents him of this. And the same thing with the fire that comes out to the great deep. And then um, the plumb line, it's like a division, a dividing line. Um, he's prophesying of the destruction of Israel. Now, Jeroboam was the first king of Israel. Um, that's... This is, this is key, because um, the unified, the first king of the nation of Israel, the unified nation of Israel was Saul, followed by King David, followed by King Solomon. But after King Solomon, the kingdom, the nation of Israel, the unified kingdom of Israel, split into two. It split into the northern tribes, which was Israel. It was referred to as Israel, um, or Ephraim. Um, and then the southern tribes, which were referred to as Judah. And so there were two kings, one in Judah and one in Israel, or Ephraim, the northern half. 
this prophecy is against Jeroboam, the first king of the northern half. Now, in the south, the, the land of Judah, they had Jerusalem, which was the capital city, and it also had the temple. And most of the prophet, or most of the kings of Judah, they worshipped God, and they tried to uh, seek a relationship with God. And so Judah sh sort of, for a while, had um, a good uh, relationship with God, but Israel, the northern part, Ephraim, ruled by Jeroboam, uh, they they didn't have the temple, and so they set up these two, two or three false temples, false altars, and one of them was at Bethel. So they were sort of always rebellious from the beginning, the northern tribes, ruled by Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was the one that conspired to set up these false temples, um, which one of them was at Bethel, where he made it his capital. Um, and that's where this high priest Amaziah comes in. <clears throat> from Bethel. He's a priest, but not to God. He's a false priest. Um, and if we go back and read, we see that Jeroboam made people the lesser men of a baser sort, like the, you know, you know, people that are unsavory. He made them the priests. So these are not trustworthy or honorable people. This guy is very manipulative. Um, and this is the Amaziah, the priest at Bethel, of a false temple. Um, and he's, he's um, slandering Amos before King Jeroboam, um, saying that he conspired against the king, which is not true. Amos simply preached the word of God, which God was condemning Jeroboam for his idolatry, um, because God gave the kingdom to Jeroboam. Uh, and it was sad that Jeroboam turned from that and he turned unto idols when it was God that gave him the kingdom in the first place. Um, and of course this Amaziah, you know, he's like rebuking Amos and he's sending to him and Amos says, I wasn't a prophet, but God called me. He gave me a vision when I was out following the sheep or whatever, the flock. Um, and because of what this false priest has done, in slandering Amos and blaspheming God, basically, God gives Amos a curse against Amaziah, um, a curse that uh, his own family will be um, suffering the consequences of the very thing that Amos is prophesying of, the, the destruction, the captivity. So what is this? What's that's it. that's sort of an overview of what's happening, but what's the point? What, what's happening here is God is showing Amos about the captivity of Israel, which does happen shortly thereafter. Um, it's within several generations, I would say. I'm not, I would have to look at a timeline, but it's not, it's only like a hundred or so years um, that it takes for the captivity to come in full. And there are a couple invasions by the uh, kingdom of Assyria that um, sort of pass this uh, captivity on to Israel. Um, but basically that's what Amos is seeing and God is warning him of. Now why did Israel go into captivity? Well because of their sin. They provoked God to wrath. Um, and God was warning Amos of this. And it's a testament to what Ezekiel talks about and that we already saw, that God was setting Amos as a watchman. A watchman, why? Why would God tell people of the destruction that they've brought on themselves because of their own evil actions? Why would God tell a person of the consequence of that before it happens? Because he wants them to change. Because he wants them to repent. When it says that um, God repents of it, it shall not be so. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Well, what he's doing is he's seen, he's showing Amos a complete destruction. Um, two times he shows Amos a complete destruction. And Amos prays and he's like, Lord, please, no, there's not, how, Jacob is very small. By whom shall he arise? And so he doesn't want Jacob to be cut off. He doesn't want Israel to be completely destroyed. And God's like, no. I will, it, it shall not be so. So the wrath of God, because of the sin of Israel, they provoke God to wrath. 
And because God is just, he is, becomes wrathful when he sees sin, evil things done. Um, and he talks about this. We've talked about this before. He sees oppression. He sees violence. He sees the idolatry, the sin, um, the fornication, all of the stuff that they're doing. He sees it and is provoking him to wrath because he can't just sit by. He is the judge. He is the exactor. He has to render to every man according to their works. Um, and so if it was up to only his, his justice and his wrath, then he would completely destroy Israel. But because he's also gracious and merciful, Amos is praying, God, please, no, don't completely destroy us. And he's like, it, it shall not be so. I'm not going to completely destroy you. There will be a remnant. And we see this a lot of times as a theme throughout the whole Bible, that because of their sin, they provoke God to wrath to the point that he should completely destroy them, but because he has mercy, he saves some of them. Enough so that he can show his mercy in them. Now, <clears throat> there's a big lesson here about this for us, and that's really the main thing I wanted to hit on. I know I haven't gotten into any cross-references yet, um, mainly because I wanted to focus on this. And that's the connection between forgiveness and repentance. A lot of people would say, why is God repenting? Doesn't it say somewhere that God doesn't repent? Um, well, the point is that this repentance, it's not so much that God did anything wrong. It's that God, um, God was planning to do something that he decided not to do because of his forgiveness, because he um, had mercy instead. And whenever it says in the Bible that God repented of something, it's not that he did something evil that he needed to turn away from. It's that he did something, he had a plan, but he chose to show mercy instead. And this is really key for us, because if God does this, then we also need to do this. Um, and it teaches some, us something about forgiveness. Let's read these verses real quick in verse uh, Amos 7 verses 2 and 3. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. So we see a connection between repentance and forgiveness, especially on God's behalf. Now this is important because um, as important, and we've talked about, I've talked in the past about true repentance, repentance from sin, um, the kind of repentance that we all need when we've made a terrible mistake and we, the only way out of it is to um, basically believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is a little bit different because God didn't necessarily do anything evil, but he still repented. So the repentance is the same type of a action that you're turning away from something. But what you're turning away from is you choosing to forgive and turn away from something that wasn't necessarily an evil intention in the first place. It was just. The wrath of God being revealed against them was a just thing. It was right. But he turned away from that. He repented of that because he chose to show forgiveness instead. Now this teaches us um, a little bit about what forgiveness should look like for us, especially in circumstances when we haven't necessarily done anything wrong. In fact, the other person or other people maybe have done wrong by us, but we still have to have this same type of mentality. Let's look at what it says in Colossians 3 um, verses 12 through 13. It says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye." So let's go through this a little bit slower. Um, so we're supposed to be putting on these things. Holy as holy and beloved, the elect of God. We've talked about that in the past, that we are the elect of God. We are His. Um, and this is what we're called to. Um, this is what 
our nature is, our new nature in Jesus Christ is to be putting on these things. Um, so what are, what are we supposed to be putting on? Bowels of mercies. So what are bowels of mercies? That's like the heart, a heart attitude of mercy. So it's, we just have it inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, inside of us, to just continually show mercy to people. That we are never going to get to the instance where we're overcome of wrath, where we want to just show wrath all the time. You know, there's this balance, right, between um, justice and mercy, justice and love. And that's God, right, truth. There's truth, but there's also grace. Um, but it's not necessarily that they're against each other. In fact, um, grace, truth can abound through grace and through mercy. And our, what we're supposed to do in this life is have bowels or hearts, a heart of mercy, to show mercy to everyone and have mercy in every situation. That we never are judgmental or wrathful or provoked to anger because of seeing injustice and I'm going to get into that a little bit later um, I'm not just ad-libbing here uh, but we're supposed to have mercy in our hearts and then also it talks about kindness again it's not we're not talking about a judgmental or superior or pious attitude we're talking about something that's very um, from a servant's attitude the mind of Christ which is and was this the mind of a servant um, humbleness of mind, again, humbleness of mind, it's being low, abasing yourself, condescending to men of low estate, meekness, again, being focused on serving God, and not focused on judging everybody, or condemning everybody, long-suffering, being able to put up with people when they do wrong stuff, and they're abrasive, or rude, or whatever, forbearing one another, and so forbearance, not just being able to put up with them, and have long suffering but also to forbear to forbear when we feel like we should do something or something should be happening that we hold back and even that sometimes um, we have the ability to um, to wait on something that we would like to do like if we are in a situation where um, you know somebody's doing something foolish and it seems like the right thing to do would be to call them out on that. But to forbear is to hold off until it's more um, discreet. Like maybe when the situation's passed and you can talk to that person one on one, you have forbear, you forborn, you waited until it was a better opportunity. And if that opportunity never comes, then you just keep forbearing and forgiving one another. And so, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So, this is the key. Forgiveness it occurs when any man has a quarrel against any. Now, what happened with Israel and God? Their sin provoked God to wrath. And so, they, because they quarreled with Him, because they became the enemies of God, He was basically their enemy. He became their enemy. Because they made themselves his enemy, he became their enemy. Because he couldn't continue putting up with the things that they were doing. But, so he had a quarrel with them and they had a quarrel with him. He was not in the wrong though. They were in the wrong. But he chose to forgive. He chose to repent of his quarrel. Which means, just think about that. He was in the right, that God was in the right with Israel, and he chose to repent of that quarrel. He chose to give up the right in order to forgive. Now, just think about that, because we know that when, it's like, think about, they have this concept of karma, right? When something bad is done, it can never be undone until something good makes up for it, or until something makes up for it. Well, with God, justice works the same way. You know, um, a sin, a transgression, has to be paid. Now, in the Old Testament, the picture of that transgression, the picture of that sin, something evil happening, it was always paid for by a sacrifice, like a lamb, or um, like offering incense, or um, the, all the various sacrifices that they gave. 
For us, though, our sacrifice is Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. He had no quarrel with us. In fact, we made ourselves his enemy. And when he was on earth, that became very clear because we, people, we crucified him. But he chose to forgive, forgive us. But he didn't just forgive us. Um, he took, he, instead of passing judgment on us, which he could have rightfully done, God could very easily have damned us all to hell because of our sin. He instead chose to forgive and forbear and take that upon himself so that it was recompensed, so that it was covered. Because the evil that we did didn't just disappear. Somebody had somewhere had to pay the price, and that was Jesus Christ. And so it set things right. It set things back in order. There was proper, you know, there was proper right. There was proper justice done because of what Jesus Christ did for us. But in order for that forgiveness to take place, he first had to not only know that he was in the right, but then to give up that us being condemned, that that was the right and just thing to do, but he had to give up that justice that he wanted, and for good reason, to enact upon us, he had to give it up in order to show grace instead. And because Jesus Christ has covered all of all sin, you know, now our job in this life is not to go around condemning people to hell. Our job in this life is not to go around judging people. Our job in this life is not to enact justice. Our job in this life is not justice. Just think about that. Because the word justice is not mentioned very much for us in the epistles of Paul, if ever. Um, I should probably do a study on a uh, quick word search, but there are, not, there are not very many instances, if any, that are ringing my bell. What is mentioned is grace, love, meekness, all the things we just read. Justice wasn't there. But there's another kind of truth, there's another kind of justice that we can be showing. And that's grace, that's forgiveness, that's mercy. And that is because Jesus Christ covered sin. Now we don't have to worry about being the ones that enact justice in this life. God has already taken care of that. Our duty is even if we know that we are in the right, that we forgive in order to show grace. At, because that's what Christ has done for us. Let's hop over to Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> or 4, Ephesians 4. <clears throat> um, let's look at verses 31 and 32. And I'm also going to throw in verse 26 and 27 afterward. Let's read 31 and 32 first. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, all these things, they come from the flesh. They come from the old man. Um, they're never justified, are they? Maybe. So usually they're not justified, but there are certain instances in which there is a um, sort of a just anger where you see something wrong happen and you get angry over it. I mean, let's just be honest. Why do people get angry in the, ever in this life? It's because they feel like they've been slighted somehow, that they have been cheated, or that somebody has done something wrong to them. That's anger, that's bitterness, that's wrath, that's clamor, evil speaking. All of that comes from people thinking that they've something wrong has been done to them. And it doesn't matter if they are in the right or they aren't. We're supposed to let all of those things go. Um, well, for several reasons. It's like we are not God, we are not the true judge. So we ultimately can't know whether we're in the right or not because it's all based off of my limited perception. It's like, I am I perceive that you've done something wrong to me from my perspective, but maybe if I was in the third per person perspective, I'd see that I, maybe I actually was in the wrong. It's not, a ma it's not a matter of who's in the wrong or who's in the right. Whenever that offense, whenever that quarrel takes place, 
we light up those feelings of anger, wrath, bitterness, malice, evil speaking, um, clamor, we let them go. We, uh, be, we let them be put away from among us. And instead, we should be, are, like it says in 32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That means that we cannot be focused on making sure that we right every wrong in this world, that there's always justice, but that we're more focused on forgiving people first, because that is what we've been called to do. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. And it's not our job to go around writing all the social ills or evils. It's our job to forgive. Um, let's go up to verse 26 and 27 real quick. It says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So he says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. You just think about that. Anger is a natural thing to happen, um, like we just talked about. It comes when some, we feel like somebody has done something wrong to us, usually. Uh, it's probably almost always that way. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try and think about all the various ways. That's what it's saying here, anyway, um, that there is an anger be angry and sin not. That, you know, like when I get in a, uh, when I get in an argument, I'm angry sometimes. Usually an argument is, the only reason I'm in an argument is because I'm angry. Uh, it's very hard in that moment to think anything but angry thoughts. The only thing you can do is be angry, but keep yourself from sinning. So how is that? Usually if I'm in an argument or a contentious situation where I get, feel myself getting angry, the only thing I can do is separate myself from that situation so that later I can calm down and come back to it with a proper perspective. Because in the moment when tensions flare, when emotions rise, when anger uh, swells up from inside of me or any of us, it's very difficult to be anything but angry. You can't just not be angry. That's why he's saying, be, be ye angry and sin not. You know, when the anger comes, for whatever reason, good or bad, it's, you accept the fact that you're angry, right? Be angry, but don't sin. Don't allow that anger to take you into a place of sin. Then, um, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you need to put that anger away quickly after you've separated yourself from the situation, after you have sinned not, making sure that you aren't going to sin because of your anger, then you go away and you put it, you put that ing that wrath away. You don't let the you don't let the sun go down upon your wrath because you don't want it to stick in there and turn into a stronghold of selfishness and bitterness and the flesh. Why? Because that can give place to the devil, and we know. Uh, like it says in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 2, it says in verse 10 and 11, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What does this mean? Paul's saying, if you forgive somebody I forgive them because ultimately we're all supposed to forgive in the person of Christ what does that mean he has forgiven everyone so we also should forgive everyone all of our quarrels why because if we don't forgive then Satan can take advantage of us um, he can get an advantage of us because that's one of his devices to destroy us to destroy the body of Christ by us not forgiving each other um, so when we hold on to that wrath the wrath, wrath being the opposite of forgiveness, we are giving place to the devil. Satan is getting an advantage of us. That's why it's one of the reasons it's so important. The main reason being that this is the pattern that God has showed us and that the Lord Jesus Christ has also shown us. But it's also because when we don't forgive, we are giving, um, we are giving strength to the enemy in our lives. 
we are giving strength to Satan in our lives, which is not something that we want to happen. I want to go to one other place, and I'm sure I could do a even bigger study on this. I just wanted to th uh, throw these few verses out that I was thinking about. Um, and I've, I've looked at these verses a lot in the past, but they're so powerful. Um, I really could read this whole chapter. It's Romans chapter 12. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, so don't worry about that. But uh, let's just read in verses 16 through 21. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So again, we see that humil humbleness of mind. We see that meekness. We're not supposed to mind high things. And that's hard to do, because a lot of times we like to make all these broad conclusions about the world, about society, about politics, about people in general. We like to mind high things, because that's pride, the pride of man, the pride of life. We like to mind high things. We're not supposed to do that, though. We're supposed to condescend to men of low estate, men and women, because the King James Version uses the word men to apply men and man to apply to humans in general. Um, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now this is huge because justice is that a person is rendered according to their works. Now God ultimately, as we're going to read in the next few verses, God ultimately does that. Although he has first shown us forgiveness. He is the judge, but he has also forgive, forgiven us. We will answer for all the things that we've done, and then all of those things will be covered. But there will be a day of reckoning, and um, there will be a, a judgment by fire where there's also works, good works that we will be judged for. Um, whether we had charity, faith, and hope, after that we have been forgiven. But what did we do with that grace that he gave us? So it's not like a get-out-of-jail-free card that we're talking about here. But we are talking about our perspective in life. Is It's not our job to recompense to any man, any person, evil for evil. If somebody does evil, we forbear. What does forbear mean? It says, don't just hold, hold off. It's like somebody cuts you off. Somebody, you know, tailgates you. Somebody flips you the bird when you're driving, what do you do? You forbear first, okay? Just like be angry and sin not. You're angry, you've been offended, somebody did something wrong, just forbear, don't sin, don't do something stupid, don't render evil for evil, don't tailgate them, don't cut them off, don't flip them the bird, don't lay on the horn. It's okay to honk, but we're, we're talking about there's a difference between a light honk and an angry, I wanna, I wanna kill you honk, which happens all the time because it's based out of anger, so be angry and sin not. So don't let that anger drive you into sin and then forgive. Put the anger away and just forgive the person. And driving is an easy example, but that is so, because it's common. It's so common for offense, for quarrels to flare up when driving. But honestly, it's a metaphor for life because we're supposed to forgive in everything. And we first forbear, it's like, don't sin, you're angry, they've done something wrong, just hold off, just let the anger subside, put it away, and forgive them. And that's a hard thing to do. It is hard, because it follows the pattern of Jesus Christ. And he, it was very hard for him to forgive. In fact, it was so hard that it resulted in the destruction of his entire self. He had to endure hell, the lake of fire, in order to forgive. That's huge. And so it is going to be painful for us to forgive each other, which is why it's so pleasing to God, because he knows that it's not easy. If it was easy to do, then anybody would do it and there wouldn't be a problem in the first place. It's hard, because it's against our human nature, and the enemy does not want us to do it. And so when we forgive, we are literally fighting in this war and doing something that is directly pleasing to God. Let's read on a little bit though. So we're not supposed to recompense to any man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Honest. Grace. You know, they can see what we are. We're not going around trying to be malicious. malicious ma malignity. Malicious is evil intent. 
It's going around trying to do evil to people. Whether it's just because we want to do evil or because we want to render evil for evil. We're not supposed to have that. It's supposed to be honest. Manifestation of the truth. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Again, our attitude isn't going to be rendering evil for evil. Being angry. Being contentious. It's live peaceable with all men, as much as life in you. Why? Because sometimes you get angry. And it doesn't lie in you to live peaceably with them. And so you have to go apart, be angry and sin not, you have that forbearance, and then you forgive. Why? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This gets into what we are talking about earlier. To avenge yourself. Revenge is somebody's done evil to me, and I'm going to do evil to them. Or I'm going to recompense. I'm going to get even, right? Avenge is to take vengeance. But we're not supposed to do either. We're literally not supposed to re revenge or avenge. Because vengeance belongs to God. He renders to every man according to their works. And he has chosen to show grace. He is the judge and he's chosen to show grace. How can we question that? And so it says, But rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The forbearance that we talked about. When you give place unto wrath, it's, oh, ooh, that person did something bad to me or to somebody else and it makes me so angry. It's like, just suck it up. Just breathe. Give place unto that wrath and then forgive. Let it go. Put the wrath away. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the wrath drive you into sin. Don't let, don't take vengeance because of that anger that comes up. Whether it's justified or not, give place unto it and then forgive. And to forgive means that you're letting go of the wrath. Therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him, if he thirst give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What does this mean? If thine enemy hunger feed him, if he thirst give him drink. Well first of all, to that's the opposite of avenging. To avenge is like, oh, you've done evil, so I'm going to not give you stuff to drink. I'm going to not give you food, right? I'm not going to bless you. But the reality is, when we're forbearing and forgiving, and giving place unto wrath, not letting it drive us into sin, that we are going to be willing to continue be blessing people, to do good unto people, even when they do evil to us. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's the point, because we live in an evil world, in an evil time. It's not, our, or it's not our job to go around making sure that we right all the ills of this world. It's our job to do good, even in times and in situations where all we seem to get is evil. Because we can overcome evil with good, because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has given us the power to do. Um, this image though, heaping coals of fire on their head. There are a couple things about this. Um, first of all, heaping coals of fire on their head, um, it's actually a blessing. And um, that culture, Jewish culture, it was actually a blessing to them um, to have somebody heap coals of, it was like it was that type of phrase was used to refer as to like a blessing. When somebody like, um, you know, you heard the the term or the phrase, my cup um, runs over, I don't know, that comes from a psalm, I forget which one it is, uh, Surely Goodness in Psalm 23? I think it's Psalm 23. Um, but anyway, there are all sorts of things, like I'm very, uh, I'm very blessed in this life, blessed, right? It's the same type of thing. Um, to heap coals of fire on their head is, is like you're blessing them. You're just giving them more and more and more, even when they only maybe give you evil. But at the same time, those coals of fire on their head, what does it do? It can cause them to be convicted, to know, oh, maybe, maybe I need to be doing this too. Maybe I need to be having good overcome evil in my life instead of allowing myself to be overcome of evil and to do evil to all those around me. Um, you know, you hear the phrase, uh, pay it forward, right? It came from that movie. When, on, when people only ever do render evil for evil, it spreads like a cancer. 
You know, it just provokes wrath, it provokes contention. That's where war comes from. It's people doing, rendering wrong for wrong. Um, but at the same time, when you choose to ignore that cycle, you just put it out of your mind. You don't, you don't allow yourself to be overcome of evil. You don't allow that wrath to turn into sin. When somebody offends you and it creates, it makes you angry, you don't let that anger drive you into sin. Um, when you put an end to that, and you choose to forbear and forgive, you overcome evil with good. And it may only be just in your life for that, that mere moment, but it can help start creating a cycle of good. And maybe in that, maybe not in that person's life, maybe so. But you have testified of good, of grace in that person's life. So they can either ex receive it or reject it. But now they have the testimony of it because of you. And also, it can help other people to be encouraged and not be driven into the same pattern of, oh, I just have to do, I have to constantly be competing with uh, everybody and I have to constantly be, you know, returning punches, exchanging punches, you know, countering. Whenever somebody does evil to me, I have to get back at them somehow. They can see that and they, then they, there's hope because we don't all have to be stuck in that same pattern of evil. So, um, just a lot of cool pictures here. The overall lesson, though, is to remember that um, all of these things, it all comes from forgiveness. And why do we forgive? We forgive because God showed us that He is forgiven. He is ultimately the one that has power to enact justice and judgment, not us. And he chose to forgive and to show mercy and to show grace. Like it talks about in Amos chapter 7 verses 2 and 3. He showed it to Israel. And then of course we saw it in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see this pattern from he who has the power to exact vengeance. From him who can, in true justice, without any bias, exact vengeance. He chose instead to show grace and forgiveness. Then what should our life look like? And it's an excellent reminder. Um, about how we need to live in this life because a lot of times it's so easy to just get provoked to wrath by things we read on the news or see in society or see in other people's behavior and we need to stop doing that it's okay to be angry for a little bit just don't let it drive you into sin and then put it away and forgive forbear and forgive see being angry and sinning is the opposite of forbearing and forgive being angry, the opposite of that is forbearing. How do we respond to anger? We forbear. How do we respond to sin? We forgive. And so those two things, they're connected. On the one negative side, we have anger and sin. Anger drives to sin. On the positive side, we have forbearance and forgiveness. And so um, we're certainly never going to be able to go through this life without ever being touched with um, allowing something to make us upset or angry. But we have to be able to respond to this the same way that God responded to it. Because when he was provoked by, to anger by people who chose to sin, like us, like the children of Israel, instead of completely destroying all of them, he chose to show grace and forgiveness instead. And that's a powerful lesson for us. And that's what I get that's my main lesson for what I get out of Amos chapter 7.